This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we got a very special return guest on the show, and that is Jack Carr. This is his fourth time on the show, but if you're not familiar with who he is, he is a retired Navy SEAL. He spent 20 years in naval special warfare, and then afterwards he got out and decided to write fiction thrillers, and he's pretty darn good at it. He's the number one New York Times bestselling fiction thriller of the James Reese series, which includes The Terminalist, True Believer, Savage Son, The Devil's Hand, In the Blood, and Only the Dead. His debut novel, the Terminal List, which is on our 100 books, Every Modern Christian Man Should Read list, was adapted for the screen starring Chris Pratt, and it became the number one Amazon Prime video series at the time it was released. It's been rewatched in a whole lot as well. That led to the announcement of season two of The Terminal List with Chris Pratt and also a spinoff series about Ben Edwards, played by Taylor Kitsch. We talk about that in the interview today. But we're talking also about his latest book in the James Reese series, and that is Red Sky Morning. It is out now. If you're listening to this on time, it is. Is out now. You can check it out. There is a link in the show notes. It is the seventh novel in the series. And as I mentioned before, he's been on three other times. We're very, very happy to have him. We're always happy to have him on the show. But we didn't just talk about the you know, Terminal List, the James Reese series, spinoffs, the new novel. We spent a lot of time at the beginning talking about the 80th anniversary of D-Day because he went over to Europe because there's the filming of the prequel series that will be coming out at some point on Amazon. But he spent a lot of time in Normandy, and we talk about that. We talk about how the people of Normandy see America and the pride they still have and seeing all of the veterans of that war that are near 100 or over 100 years old, being there with you know, his daughter and getting to see his, you know, his daughter and son ex- experience that, but also the difference between what the youth of Normandy think about America and what the youth of America think about America. Again, you have youth here in this country that think what happened on October the 7th of last year was justified because they've been kind of marinating in this milieu of the public school system and Marxism and socialism and communism. And they're kind of into all these ideas and they've come around to thinking that, well, maybe uh, what Hamas did wasn't so bad. And so we, we talk about that. We talk about the upcoming presidential election, how regardless of what the outcome is, we're going to see unrest. We're going to see riots. And in some ways, I, I think we're all expecting for the country to burn at least to a certain degree. But then we do dig into a lot of questions about the dark wolf series. That's the spinoff actually of the terminal list. And that's going to be the one that follows the character, Ben Edwards played by Taylor Kitsch. We talk about when true believer is going to come out with Chris Pratt thereafter. We dig into the new novel, but here's the thing. Got to announce this. We did the same thing last year and you guys loved it, but I have, you know, a specialty, a special treat for those of you that have already read red sky morning or listened to it. We're going to do our normal interview. Then I'm going to do my normal outro. And then you'll get to the end of our outro music And then Jack is sticking around for a spoilers only segment where we talk about Red Sky Morning. So guys, if you're listening to this on time and you have not read Red Sky Morning yet, if you've not listened to it, make sure you stay off social media so you miss spoilers on social media. But also, 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 do not listen to the segment after the outro. I don't know how many times I have to say it, but I'll say it one more time. If you've not read Red Sky Morning or listened to Red Sky Morning, do not listen to the section that takes place after the outro music of this because there will be spoilers. You're not going to want to go there. So, guys, very, very excited about this one. I had a great time with Jack. So without further ado, let's get into it. Jack Carr, welcome back to the show. This is now your fourth appearance on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Now, I just need to know where we rank. So is it like number one New York Times bestselling author, Number one show on Amazon, fourth appearance on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Is that kind of where we're at right now? I'd put you between maybe those two. So I'll move you up and out since this is four. I'm okay with the meat of that sandwich. That's good. As long as we're on the Mount Rushmore. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, man. Awesome. Okay, very good. I do need... Hey, it's always great talking to you. Now, this is the first time we've talked to you in your new library. So let's talk about that. That is quite the setup you got behind you. Not bad, not bad. Yeah, it's uh, look at that. It's almost there. I kind of it was in the middle of writing when I started moving in up here, so I wouldn't have to rush off to another place in town, borrow a friend's house. Uh, so I, I'm organized. I'm pretty good in here, but uh, not quite there. Getting getting closer. I mean, it's it's. I have my own organization, uh, the way I do it, like by timeline, by war, whether it's terrorism, general insurgencies, general or a specific part of the world, that sort of thing. So this is the nonfiction room aside from, uh, Ian Fleming over here and a couple of, of mine. Um, and then all the fiction is in the other room over there. So there's a whole nother section over there. That's all the, all the fiction. So yeah, it's not, not a bad spot. 
Well, it may not be up to your liking right now, but from this angle, it looks absolutely fantastic. So I'm very, very satisfied with it. But before we dig into any of the content, the new novel, any of that type of stuff, we need to talk about you just getting back from Europe. And so some people go to Europe to find themselves. Some people go to walk some old cobblestone streets. But you were there for the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. And you and your family did a ton of stuff there. I know it was fairly you know, important for you to see even your kids doing some stuff over there. So take us through that whole experience, Jack. Yeah. So the Best Defense Foundation, founded by Donnie Edwards, um, former NFL player and awesome guy. I met him, gosh, maybe almost a decade ago now, I guess. But when, when he was in the NFL, he started just taking World War II veterans back to the battlefields on which they fought just on his own own dime. Uh, someone mentioned they wanted to go back and he started doing that. And his grandfather was at Pearl Harbor in uh, December of 1941. So he passed on all these lessons to, to Donnie. And so he has this special place in his heart for, for veterans, particularly World War II veterans. So uh, first time I went and did it was for the 80th anniversary commemoration events of Pearl Harbor. Took my daughter back there there when she was 15 and seeing her interact with these veterans all nearing 100 years old some over 100 years old then even was uh you know, made me so proud and was so great for them they loved talking to someone in her generation and it was amazing mm -hmm. to see them just click together so then that uh june on the for the 78th commemoration events for d-day we went back to, to normandy did that together uh as well and you're, it's a lot. I mean, you are, you are taking, you're caring for these veterans. You're taking them, uh, getting them in and out of their rooms, in and out of their wheelchairs to all these different events, making sure they're eating, making sure they're taking their medicines, like all of that. And it's, I mean, it's so rewarding. And she got to learn so much from these guys. Uh, and this time for the 80th, we did the same thing, but I brought my son over as well. So he was a little young to actually, you know, do the, uh, the care, but he got to shake their hands, look them in the eye and say thank you to as many World War II veterans as he possibly could could. So the thing that stood out in the 78th and this one is just how much the people of Normandy appreciate what was done for them 80 mm. years ago. And they have not forgotten and they passed it down. So you have these, we go to do a school visit and there's kids age like five years old and all the way up in the school visit was probably kindergarten, eighth grade and American flags everywhere. Uh, and they are so appreciative. You can tell in their face how excited they are to thank a World War II veteran. We make these baseball cards for them. So it has their stats on it and they sign them and hand them out to the kids and the kids are all uh, collecting these things. They talk about what they did in the war on the back and has that they look like now and then what they looked like then. And it's just a, such a great experience for, for everyone. But seeing all of Normandy come out, it is absolutely insane. There's uh, aside from American flags, there's 82nd airborne flags, 101st wow. airborne flags. Everybody's dressed up in uh, period clothing. There are Jeeps everywhere, military Jeeps from that era. There are Harley motorcycles, Indian motorcycles from World War II. It is absolutely incredible to see. I wish every American could experience it. Well, I mean, I couldn't get over there to experience it. So I was living vicariously through you and a bunch of other friends of mine. I knew probably half a dozen people uh, personally that were over there taking care of business. And as you were describing that, Jack, I was struck by what you were describing with the people of Normandy and specifically the youth. And then I contrast that with what we see here in this country with our youth, how they see our veterans, how they see our involvement of wars of any kind, not just the GWAT, not just modern wars, but some of the older wars. But then even specifically, Matt, October the, or Jack, October the 7th. You know, we see people going to the mat to fight about why Hamas is in the right, why, you know, all the free Palestine stuff. And we see the, the protests going on around the country. And so talk to me a little bit about that, because, like, I think we have a moral sickness. I think this isn't going out on a limb. We have a moral sickness that has certainly infested our, our young children of this country. But to see them denigrate the sacrifices of soldiers of any era and then to get behind a group whose express purpose is to uh, murder, rape, and eradicate an entire race of people, it just it boggles the mind, Jack. I know. And it's hard not to think about those things when you're over in Normandy, seeing those flags. I mean, the whole side of the school, huge American flag yeah, on the yeah. side of the school as we pulled up with the veterans, all the kids outside just screaming and yelling and waving those flags and waiting for us to unload these guys from the buses, get them in their wheelchairs and then wheel them in. And they're just going crazy. I mean, it's like rock stars. It's great. It's, it's, insane. So when you see that, it is hard not to compare it to what you see in this country or what you think you would see if you brought a World War II veteran to a school. 
in the United States. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think they would get the same kind of reception as they got in Normandy. And I think the difference is that they were occupied in France, yeah. particularly. And then, of course, in Normandy, there's there are landings. Uh, and to have my kids standing on the beach at Omaha and in Omaha Beach and w talking to someone who was first out of his landing craft on D-Day, I mean, that's pretty, pretty powerful. So running across those beaches, looking up at the, and you're looking at that, that's a long way to run. And you're thinking, look at all this open space and look at the high ground up there occupied by the Germans. And where, and you can talk to these guys and they point out where, where the machine gun that you can yep. see the bunkers, a lot of the bunkers are still there. You can see like a little trench networks um, that's grown over, but they also point out where just like the sandbag positions were, where the temporary type positions were uh, with machine guns on that, on that day. So, um, it's really, it's hard not to think about uh, the differences between the United States and France when it comes to the appreciation for what was done for them. But I think it's being occupied and then being liberated because you think that it would dilute as you tell those stories and pass them on to these different generations. You think those stories would dilute a bit and they have not. Um, there's just mm. as much excitement and appreciation, authentic appreciation in the faces of these kids as there are in the adults. And it's remarkable to see. And now in the United States, I know I mentioned that you, I don't think I'd see that in the United States, but the closest I've seen, and it is uh, almost the same, was in Honolulu for the 80th mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor events. And the last day there, they had a parade and people came out. And once again, what happened there? Well, they were attacked. Uh, obviously not occupied, but they were attacked. And so I think that's something that is, uh, that's similar between what happened in Hawaii, what happened in France, although different, um, one occupied, one just attacked, but that same type of feeling uh, was evident in the thanks that the people were giving to these World War II veterans, both in that parade in Honolulu and in uh, uh, in Normandy. But it's not just a day in Normandy. It's not just June 6th. It is two full weeks of events out there. And it does not slow down. Mm -hmm. There is uh, the day we left was just, there was just as much excitement as there was the day we arrived. And it is, it's incredible to witness. It's certainly incredible to witness. And probably one of the most moving things that I saw, which I, I shared on our Instagram, was this veteran that was being walked out to the beach and got his feet in the water. And it was basically all he could to physically bend over and touch the water with wow. his hands. And just the look on his face. And even right now, like I'm getting overwhelmed with emotion just thinking about because that's not a beach. You know what I mean? That That's not just sand. That's not just water. That was this guy's life. He can still smell the dead bodies, I'm sure. He can still know, you know, if he was going to the bathroom in his pants on the way before they 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 dropped they dropped them off on the boats. And it's just an incredible thing. And then then I look at where we are now, and that was kind of what I alluded to in the last question. But Jack, as we sit here in the summer of 2024, we're just months away from a presidential election. And I see this in some of your writings. I, I can kind of pick up on this on the novels, but I'm not usually worried about elections because it's like, yeah, your guy may win, your guy may lose, but we'll move on. Something feels different about 2024, Jack. And I don't, I'm not an alarmist. I don't like to be hyperbolic for the sake of seeming extreme. I feel like there is going to be guaranteed unrest regardless of who wins because it's either the election was stolen right? And both parties will make that argument or, you know, Hitler is, is incarnate and now staying in the white house or back in the white house. And I think either way, the country is going to burn. And again, I don't want to be hyperbolic. I, I keep saying that, but I just don't want it to be that way. What's your read? Cause you have a very deep appreciation for, for history, but also the norms of society and what that leads to in terms of narratives politically, what's your read on what we're going to be seeing at the beginning of November of this year? Well, unfortunately, I have the same concerns, but I do, I think back to the 1860s and I think back to the end of the Civil War and I think back to how that country, our country came together again after an actual war um, that claimed more lives than any other war we've been involved in. Um, and when you still have uh, people on to the sides back then that didn't want us to come back together. Um, so I, I I, so I think about that, but then I think, well, what didn't we have back in the 1860s? Well, we didn't have social media. Uh, we didn't have this virtual way mm -hmm. to continue to divide uh, and influence thoughts and behaviors uh, in your pocket at 24 hours a day, essentially. Um, 
and a populace that might not even realize that they're being manipulated. And that awareness is something I think that uh, is, is a baseline when engaging on social channels or engaging over modern platforms is that, um, you know, it's not just a commercial trying to sell you a new laundry detergent, like back in the 80s, as you yeah. wait for your show to pick back up. Uh, it is something that is controlling your very thoughts um, and not necessarily to your benefit uh, at the same time. So it's, I think that that Peace and that awareness is probably a baseline from which to then move forward. But uh, they didn't have that in the 1860s. So mm -hmm. had they, do you think we would come back together? I don't know. But we'll never know. But uh, it is there today. And it's a tool. And like all tools, it can be used for essentially good or evil. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily the person engaging on social channels even knows um, that they're being used and this tool is being used to manipulate them. So I don't have any good answers, but I would say be prepared. Always good to be prepared. Certainly. And I mean, even here recently, I'm sure you saw where they brought smartphones and social media to this remote tribe in the Amazon. And within days or weeks, these people were um, obsessed with and probably addicted to watching pornography and uh, scrolling social media. So like the elders, what? I have not seen that. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Jack, you, you need to go look that up because the elders of the village are like, what happened? Are are we haven't seen our youth? It's because they're inside scrolling porn and social media, and so it's like that. That gives you an idea. These people aren't digital natives, and I don't. I, there's no tongue in cheek there. They're not digital natives like you know kids born like my kids are four and two. They'll be digital natives. They've grown up around technology and they've seen technology in pockets and in the palms of their hands. That is not what this group is, and they become completely and utterly obsessed. So that just kind of gives gives over to like the power of these tools and of AI and quantum computing, and we'll certainly get there here in a second. But we need to move from all that depressing stuff that makes everyone sad to some fun stuff, okay? So let's talk about your work on the big, the big ish screen. So obviously, the terminal list was an absolute grand slam on Amazon. I was so excited to see that it was successful because I was nervous. I thought, oh gosh, what if it sucks? And then it certainly didn't suck, but it was like, okay, it doesn't suck, but what if no one watches it? And that didn't work out either because everyone decided to watch it and they're re-watching it but as far as i know right now the prequel spin-off series called the terminalist dark wolf is it's i guess it's in production or pre-production right now it's going to be following ben edwards which we were introduced to in the terminalist that's going to be played by taylor kitsch so where are we out in the process of the filming of that what's the plot going to be you know how much involvement do you have let's just start there yeah, well, Amazon will never share the exact numbers uh, like all the social media companies. You know, they they, they don't share that data with anyone. Um, but it, the the indication is that that things were worked out very well yeah. uh, on their investment in the terminal list uh, because we have this uh, spinoff prequel origin story and we have a second season with True Believer that we'll move into when we're done filming um, this uh, Dark Wolf that you mentioned. So it's, uh, so that's a good sign. And right now we're filming it. It's over, we're filming it over in Europe right now. So that's where I was before I was up in, in Normandy for the D-Day commemoration events. Um, and I got to create this show with David DeGilio, mm -hmm. the showrunner. And really from, so it's from its very inception all the way through where it is now uh i've been involved at every every turn from creating it outlining it uh picking the writers for the writer's room uh casting um so it's, it's been fantastic and i got to learn a lot on the uh the process of bringing the terminal list to uh to screens uh so i got to learn a ton there as an executive producer and uh, give my input on all the scripts and then when i was on set and all those things so i learned a ton so i can add even more value this time around and uh, getting to create it with david agilio was uh was absolutely amazing so uh if the scripts are any indication and what i've seen so far of the filming is any indication this is going to be uh an awesome show and it really takes follows ben edwards from the seal teams into the cia shows um that journey and uh so you can you can as a viewer you'll be able to figure out like wh why he could do the things that he did in the terminal list so that's a that's a way to get around saying any spoilers right there for anyone who hasn't hasn't seen it or read the book but uh but the ben edwards character was one that i think the writers in the writer's room for uh the show for the first one did such a better job with wow. than i did in the book and uh they added so much more nuance to the character and then Taylor Kitsch showed up and just took it to a whole another level. So that's something I think that was done a lot better in the show than was done in the book. And, uh, and Taylor's just an awesome, awesome guy all the way around. So filming that right now and it's, uh, it's looking awesome. So I think it's going to absolutely crush. 
Now, what Chris Pratt did with James Reese, I feel like Taylor Kitsch did uh, with Ben Edwards. And, and so are we going to get to know where he got his shotgun prowess? So I think anyone who watched the show, did, are we going to have any uh, allusions to that in the prequel series? Yep, you'll have to, uh, to tune in, but there just may, may be a shotgun in there. But uh, interesting filming overseas. I mean, I was always f- forgiving when I saw things in shows, you know, that didn't quite fit or, or whatever else. So always, because I didn't want to, you know, you don't want to make yourself miserable, those around you miserable, uh, you know, unless it's like just so blatant that it's hard to ignore. Uh, but I'm even more forgiving now. First, after seeing uh, all it takes to bring a show mm. to life, and that was filming in the United States with all with access to all the gear, to the weapons, to everything that, that you may need. Now, when you go overseas and try to do that, moving weapons in through all these export and import forms, ATF form. Like it is very difficult to uh, get the weaponry right if you're filming in another country. Uh, and so I'm even more forgiving now when I see something on screen, especially if I know that they filmed it in another country. You can't just like go back to the armory unless mm. six months earlier you filled out the paperwork and had it shipped four months earlier. You're yeah. just not going to get that thing that you need if there's a change in the in the script. But um, that's a long way of saying that uh, that uh, they had. There'll be some good stuff in there for for people, but uh, but is but it's also very difficult to uh, to do things like that overseas. So it's uh, it's just how how it is. But it's gonna it is gonna crush. You gotta adapt. You know, just like anything else in life. You know, you can't get the exact weapon that you want for something. And you're like, oh, especially for someone like me, where weapons tell a story. Um, yeah. Well, then you make you have to adapt and you have to figure out. And that's the problem solving piece of it. That's being creative and uh, and and doing and working with what you with what you have. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be good. And it really, it starts off as a, uh, you know, action military side, cause it's transitioning from seals to the intelligence side of the house. And then it turns into more of an espionage thriller from there still with a lot of action, but, uh, and it has that more of an espionage feel to it. Whereas the terminal list was a conspiracy thriller, yeah. psychological thriller, action thriller. This turns from action into a, uh, an espionage type thriller. So I think I, I don't think, I think that's probably everything I can say. About okay. All right. We don't want to get you in trouble. We don't want you to violate any NDAs, but so, so you went or Amazon, I guess y'all went with the prequel spinoff dark wolf first, as opposed to doing, you know, continuing the terminal list with true believer. So here we are, you know, for, for fans of the novels, we're ready for, you know, James Reese to go to Africa. And then it's like, you know, pause, pump the brakes. We actually are going to go back in time and come back to this. So can you give me an idea of like what, uh, what the decision making process looked like was that because of like Taylor's schedule? Was it because of Chris's schedule? Because you know Chris isn't a spring chicken, and this is obviously a very physical and intensive role of playing James Reese, not just for a motion picture, but for an entire season, like an eight to ten hour long motion picture. What was kind of the reason for doing the prequel as opposed to just keeping the James Reese saga going? Yeah, well, you, I mean, I guess you could film them both at the same time um but you have to you have a creative team that stays the same so i think you need to um it gets more difficult it spreads you more thin if you're going to try to do things uh at the same time you know run run two shows at the same time um so scheduling certainly is yep. a huge part of what came first i mean we wanted to do the spin-off but scheduling wise you know, guys at, at uh, Chris's and Taylor's levels are, uh, you know, they're booked up, you know, they're, they're in demand. Yep. So it's just, and then you have a writer strike on top of that. And even though the writer strike wasn't a year long, it did put us back probably by about a year um, when everything compounds upon itself. So uh, the writer strike certainly Im- impacted scheduling um, probably by about a year, I'd say. And then of course, Chris's schedule and Taylor's schedules dictate a lot of this. So, uh, so all those things come together and, you know, you see comments online and I don't really re- you respond to them, but uh, sometimes I see them, you know, people are like, why didn't Drew Believer first? I want to see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Chris has to film five other movies right. in that time. So, uh, you know, I guess you can talk to his manager person commenting, um, or whatever, but, uh, you know, those things are, are scheduled years in advance. So, uh, so that's all, it's just all part of the process and it's all great. Yeah. It's like, look, he's got to be star Lord and he's got to be Garfield and he's got some other stuff that no one knows about yet. And he's doing a bunch of other things, but you mentioned a movie there, him filming movies. I don't necessarily want this because I like the, the way y'all have got the terminal list and how you set it up over, you know, episodic season. But is there any chance that at some point during the James Reese universe, we will have a major motion picture? Ooh, interesting question. We shall see. I think that's the best way to answer that one. All right. So I do like making people jealous, Jack. It's one of my favorite things. I like making people uncomfortable and I like making people jealous. 
And that could never have been more so true than whenever you sent me this beautiful thing for only the dead. So this is like the special, if you're only listening to this right now, this was the special hard case with the book and everything in there. And, you know, I I was a little disappointed last year in myself. I didn't make the coolest video because like, you know, the Haley strategic guy basically made a short film to show this. I think Tim Kennedy jumped out of a helicopter or an airplane to end up, you know, grabbing this. My buddy Chad Robichaud did something as well. So if you send, are you sending yeah, these out again? Out because yeah, 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 that was amazing. I, yeah. yeah. Tim did the helicopter. Chad did, uh, did jumped out of a plane. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard came out of the ocean. Um, hers was, I mean, had the Magnum theme behind it, which was amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Travis did the uh, did the short film, like you said, sniper operation there. So people got so creative. That was so cool to see. It was just uh, you know humbling and so fun to see that stuff. Well, now see, so I've got an idea in mind for this year. Are you sending these out again for the new one, Red Sky Morning? As soon as we're done with this, I walk downstairs and continue boxing and signing. Well, Jack, I know I am already on the list because I was on the list last year, but I got something special for you this year. I don't know if I'm going to outdo all these people that apparently walk around with an entire production crew, but I just got to tell you, the new novel, Red Sky Morning, look at this thing. It is absolutely beautiful. There's uh, some. There's a nice little Easter egg right there for those of y'all that will end up reading this with the plane, but you're going on tour in support of this. I think this is the first time you've actually done like a book tour for one of your releases. This is the seventh novel in James Reese series. Like you're just deepening the story. You're deepening our connection with James Reese, his character, his family, you know, his extended family, you know, friends that are like deeper than blood and all that. So let's talk about the seventh, uh, the seventh novel, the seventh thriller. What is it about this one? That's going to get everybody going. What's the plot going to be like? How excited are you to go on tour? Yeah, so every book has uh, a theme that helps guide the writing process. I write it on a yellow sticky and I put it right there so that uh, anything that I write is either tied directly or more importantly, indirectly to that theme. So this one was about loyalty and questions of loyalty. So that was the guiding principle here. And I explore that through really this autonomous control of different military platforms, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, uh, passive targeting, hypersonic missiles, uh, and vis-a-vis the relationship between China, the United States and Taiwan. So, um, so that was that was really the uh, the baseline. I introduced a character called Alice, a quantum computer, really a sentient quantum computer, uh, two books ago in mm-hmm. in the blood. And I did so much research because I had no touch point with quantum computing or artificial intelligence in the military. Uh, so I did a ton of research for that book, and I'd be shocked if what I described in that book two years ago is diff- very, is significantly different than uh, as it's written. Mm. And then for the next one, I didn't want to rely on that character as a crutch, yep. meaning I didn't want to have uh, James Reese, uh, like Michael Knight in the 80s, call the kit car on his watch, you know, and all of a sudden saves the day. So I had to sideline her for the next novel just to make sure that I was, wasn't tempted to use her as a crutch. But I've introduced this character now. And since that book came out, chat GPT has become part of the lexicon, right. artificial intelligence becomes um, uh, for, at the forefront of people's minds when they're thinking about their profession, their careers, uh, their children's its impact on the future. Part of the writer strike was uh, how to deal with AI in, in Hollywood. That was a significant um, contention point. So since I wrote that book, artificial intelligence, chat GPT in particular, has uh, become uh, much more uh, impactful on people's lives than it was before that, that novel. So now people are much more aware of artificial intelligence and where we're headed and just looking at technology and technological innovation and the uh, rapidly expanding role of technology in our lives over the last two decades. If you think about chat GPT or artificial intelligence in general and that rapid pace of technological innovation, then I think some of these things that I talk about in the book are going to be here well before we think. And when you're looking at the enemy's use of artificial intelligence or quantum computing or these things like passive targeting and hypersonic missiles in their war plans, then you in turn have to incorporate that into yours. So getting inside your enemy's decision-making process, making decisions that uh, more rapidly than your enemy is making those decisions, um, those are important. And if so, let's say in this case, China, if China has this capability and it's similar to ours and we don't have that 
you know, or if we didn't exploit that capability and they do, then all of a sudden missiles are landing before generals and uh, elected representatives in the executive branch or even out of bed. So that's, uh, that's, that's really part of the basis for this. And that's where uh, those, those uh, technologies and global ambitions collide with James Reese in the pages of Red Sky Morning. Hey guys, real quick. If you're anything like me, you are constantly on the lookout for high quality products that are actually made here in America by American hands. The problem is that a lot of American companies have outsourced their labor overseas. So it's an American company, but it's supporting people that don't live here. So I've always wanted to partner with an American company that prioritizes America, American workers, and making all of their materials here in this country. That's why I want to remind you that we are partnered with Origin. Origin is an apparel company based in Maine, and they are focused on getting as much manufacturing back to the United States as they can possibly do. What do they make? They make the best jujitsu gis on the planet, and these are the only jujitsu gis that are made completely in America. They also make jeans. Yes, they're stretchy and awesome. They also make amazing hunting gear, and I know you guys love your Kuyu and your Sitka, but those companies use overseas labor, and they don't do that to help you guys out. They do that to increase their profit margins. Origin also makes boots and work boots, and yes, that does include steel toe boots. And in the fall of last year, they launched a line of everyday clothing. Their Versa pants are their everyday pants, and they are just especially phenomenal. They also make other outdoor clothes and workout clothes, and they're launching new apparel stuff all the time. If you haven't already, you need to check them out and support a company that supports America and America's workers. Try Origin out today by going to www.originusa.com. That's originusa.com. Use the promo code UNDAUNTED to get 10% off of your order. Again, that's originusa.com. Promo code UNDAUNTED to get 10% off of your order. Well, we're certainly going to talk more about Red Sky Morning, and I just want to reiterate something I talked about in the introduction, guys. After my normal outro, after the metal music and all that, we're going to do some major, major, major spoiler questions uh, regarding the entire series and specifically Red Sky Morning. But I want to go a little bit deeper on what you just talked about because, you know, one of the dominant themes of Red Sky Morning is the expanding role of tech uh, inside of warfare and global conflict. Now, there are some people that think of AI as like, oh, you know, I can put a picture into this AI software and it, it'll take the fuzzy out. It'll go from pixelated to high def. You know, that's all people think about. And then there's other people that literally go to bed worried about the sentience of AI and AI starting to make decisions for itself. And it not just being something like a toaster that we can just unplug from the wall and say, well, that got a little weird that we're not going to be able to do that, that it'll, it'll program itself to basically be able to be inside of sentience. But I don't, again, I don't want to be alarmist, but it does, we see some embers of that now. And the technology is still so young and well, at least the, the market side of it, the part that's been marketed to the generalized public. But where do you see this going and how quickly do you think we'll get there? Because there are people, I heard Joe Rogan on a show the other day say, this is the last presidential election where we're not going to have an AI candidate. Now, he's Joe Rogan. He could have been high when he said it. There, there's no telling. But like, where do you see this, this going in terms of how AI is not just going to be a part of our lives, but be the dominant part? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just the thing. That's, it's tough because it's probably going to be much more prevalent than it is today. Mm. It's going to advance much more rapidly than other emerging technologies. When you think about things like, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnologies, uh, you look at something like, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink, mm. um, all of these things are moving forward at a, at a pace unheard of in human history. So uh, I'm not, I can't predict the future, but I would say that it is going to be much more prevalent in all aspects of our life than, uh, than we may be comfortable with now. But the other side of that is, of course, that people are being essentially uh, groomed to accept it. And right. uh, we are very comfortable. And that takes us back to really uh, Normandy 80th anniversary uh, D-Day events yeah. and being very comfortable in this country, not understanding what it is like to live under occupied, essentially Nazi rule. Um, and just to not have that connection like they do in northern France. In this country, we are very comfortable and we have been very comfortable for a long time. And uh, people don't even, the generation that lived through the depression is passing on, the very last of them are gonna be gone soon. Uh, they lived through a depression, 
They fought World War II. They came home. They started businesses. They started families. And they built this country into the greatest nation on earth. And unfortunately, um, one of the second order effects of that is a generation that has grown up really without those tests, without um, with without having to overcome those things that their grandparents and great grandparents did, uh, which has led to a level of complacency um, and not even appreciating what was done for them, what was sacrificed for them, what was sacrificed for, for them from the inception of this country, uh, really up until today. Um, and then you have a distrust in, of course, leadership. And we see it play out with, uh, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And you see the best that senior level military leaders could do was that I had 20 years to prepare for that. Mm. And then as a, as a parent, or as, let's say as a high school kid that we had, it was intent on joining the military. You watch that and think, oh man, well, I'm still going to serve or hey, maybe, Hey, I'm not going to serve anymore. Look at that's the best these guys could do after 20 years. Yeah. What kind of operation are they running over there? Um, all you need to do is apply common sense and logic to the problem set. You don't even need a background in military history and strategy or tactics. You don't even need to see a military documentary or movie. All you need to do is apply logic and common sense to the problem set. And you would have done a much better job than our senior level leaders did with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So you have a distrust in, uh, in institutions like the military that typically have had a high level of trust. Um, and of course, then you have politicians, and I mentioned this in the book, beating the stock market uh, by a significant margin. Uh, mm. Some outliers beat it by like much way outliers. And then you have people that just yeah. you know, make it up. Exactly. And you, you have uh, some that just beat it by five, 10 or whatever it is, mm. but, but they all do is the point. So it's, it's tough. It's, it's extremely difficult to think about uh, the, the future when you have a distrust in government, distrust in the, the military, and you have these corporations that are acting more like governments and governments that are acting more like corporations, essentially. So that's what you're dealing with. And that's what the next generation is going to be dealing with. And AI, quantum computing is going to be a uh, very large part of that. And what does that look like when it comes to things like, like freedom? I don't know. I don't know. Well, so let's actually, yes. let's go into that freedom piece. And I want to get back to the GWAT as well. But what AI is doing, Jack, and what the companies that are propagating this technology are doing is they're removing the opt-in option. So you could have opted into whether or not you're going to use Instagram, opt into whether or not you're going to use TikTok. But Apple just got through announcing with their uh, version 18 of their, their iOS that chat GPT is going to be part of the operating system. So not Apple's version of chat GPT, chat GPT. So if you were trying to avoid the robot, right? Well, it's either have a dumb phone, you know, oh, it's not really a dumb phone, but like have, have a droid, right? You, you know, get used to the green text bubbles, or if you're going to continue to be in the Apple universe, you're just gonna have to deal with a partner. Chat GPT will be on your device. It will be scanning all of your pictures, all of your text messages, all of your phone calls, all of your eye movements. And if you want to keep the iPhone, you have to keep that, that, you know, capability. And so we're not getting the chance to opt in or opt out unless we decide we're just going to live completely off the grid. And I guess that's still certainly an option at this point, but you got to make sure you don't have a laptop that can be tracked. You got to make sure you have a vehicle that can't be tracked and, you know, things that you've talked about in the novels and talked about uh, elsewhere as well. But one thing that was interesting from the epilogue of Red Sky Morning, you were talking about different novels kind of being time capsules for like, okay, here's, you know, the novels that were written during this period of time and this period of time and what things are going to look like, you know, the novels written during the GWAP period. But I want to go all the way back. Let's take all the, all the stuff that you were talking about with the pullout from Afghanistan, which we've talked about in some of our previous conversations. Uh, kids, you know, those farm, you know, farm boys from Indiana aren't, aren't wanting to go into the military anymore because they don't want to represent a military that celebrates Pride Month more than it celebrates its potential lethality in a, in a conflict, right? Seemingly. If you could go all the way back to before you showed up in San Diego or San Diego area for buds, would you still knowing what you know now, would you still have served in the way that you did? And the reason why I asked that Jack is I don't mean to be offensive because some people get offended at that, but there are a lot of guys that served maybe just four years, maybe a full 20 or maybe even beyond that, that are now looking internally and being like, was my sacrifice worthwhile because of where we ended up in the pullout of Afghanistan? Was my sacrifice worthwhile? Because now we seem more intent on funding foreign wars as opposed to making sure when we have to fight one that we're going to win 
Some would say we haven't won a war since World War II either because we don't have the stomach for it anymore. So take that wherever you want to go with it. Yeah, well, interesting that the uh, Department of War and the Secretary of War changed to the Department of Defense in 1947, the reorganization of our defense and uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, and then with that came a uh, essentially the disappearance for all practical purposes of accountability. Mm -hmm. So up to, up to and through World War II, uh, general senior level leaders were held accountable for their failures. And George Marshall was a big part of that in the lead up all the way through World War II. We didn't start out with a lot of those names that we all know today as leading us through World War II, all those generals that they make movies about from, uh, from Patton to MacArthur, all those guys. Uh, there were other people out there that fell by the wayside because they were given a chance, they didn't measure up, uh, and they were replaced. And same thing in the Civil War. It took a, uh, President Lincoln went through a lot of generals before he found Grant. And, uh, and after, 1947, we see a different military and we see this industry and we see this perpetual war and we see people, senior level leaders, not being held accountable for their mistakes, for their failures. We see it become a career, not a profession. And we see them then transition into this new industry of def this defense establishment. So we see this machine that has only continued to grow and become more powerful in the years since 1947. So it's, uh, I understand completely people would question what they did. Was my sacrifice worth it? Or was the, the sacrifice of my friend worth it who didn't make it home? those sorts of questions. And I, you know, everyone can deal with these things in their own way. I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong way to, to deal with it. It's different for everyone. Um, but uh, looking at it in those terms, I don't know if it is uh, the most healthy because you might come to the answer that it wasn't. Hmm. And that's maybe a lot, very logical conclusion, but I don't think looking at it in those terms is necessarily healthy. You were down there, you're doing the best you could, uh, with what you had at the time for your brothers in arms to your right and your left. And, uh, and that's it. And if you did that and you didn't leave anything on the field and you prepared as much as you possibly could to make de good decisions under fire, then there is absolutely nothing that you need to regret. Um, you stood up to serve your country is because senior level leaders made strategic level blunders. That is not on you. And, uh, and it's not on the person to your right or left or that person who didn't come home. Mm. Um, so it's, but it's tough to, it's tough to think through. It's tough to, you know, you have to think, you can think about that stuff for the rest of your life. You can dwell on it. Um, or you can use it going forward and you can pass on these lessons to future generations through your circle. However, whether it's one person, two person, 40 million people, whatever that is, um, you can make sure that you're doing what you can now to make sure that your kids understand and that your kids uh, take these lessons going forward, turn them into wisdom. We don't do that as a country. We typically uh, make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Um, we don't turn lessons into wisdom going forward. So that's uh, something I try to do with uh, whether it's a social post about history or it's, uh, you know, it's history that's woven into the novels or my first nonfiction book comes out this September on the 1983 Marine Bay barracks bombing. Um, so I feel like that's, you know, that's, that's doing what I can to preserve some of these lessons that so we don't have to learn them again in blood. But uh, once again, we have not proven that we are very good at doing that. When later this year, we'll certainly have you back on to talk about uh, your foray into the nonfiction world. But just real quick, um, in the week or two after the pullout from Afghanistan, I had a bunch of people come on and do mini episodes on this show. And these were seals that serve uh, gold star widows, um, you know, Tay Kyle, Chris Kyle's uh, wife came on here just to kind of give their thoughts and give their message to veterans. And we, we couldn't work out uh, the, the schedule with you to get you on during that two week period. But I feel like you gave me your answer that I would have asked you to the same question, you know, you know, years ago. And it's, hey, like, this isn't a you problem. This isn't a problem with the person that was to your left or to your right or to your buddy that didn't come home or perhaps even to the buddy that you held whenever they took their last breath. Like, this is not a you issue. This is a them issue. You still did the work and you went 
where most of us are unwilling to go, that didn't raise our right hand and say, I'm going to protect this family or this family. It is like a family, but this country from enemies, foreign and domestic. And you went over there and you pushed back darkness on our behalf so that we could be here and do whatever we want, whatever we want to do. And so that's what you did, Jack. That's what other guys that went downrange did. And even to the people that maybe never left, went outside the wire, but just what they did on base helped to equip those guys that were going out, those devil dogs that were going out and taking care of business outside the wire. So I really appreciate you giving me uh, some more context on that. But in terms of the interview interview, that's it for me for right now. I'm anxious to get to the spoiler side of this, but is there anything else that you want the generalized audience to know, the audience that has not read Red Sky Morning yet? Is there anything that you want to leave with them? Parting thoughts. Well, I just want a little more uh, context to what we just talked about. Yep. I did do two blogs in the blog section of my we website. I called one fire of the generals. Um, and that's, uh, that's on the blog section of my website from August, September timeframe of 2021. So they can go back and, and check those out. If anybody wants a little more, a uh, little more context. Um, I skimmed through them again recently as I redid the, the website and, uh, those feelings and, uh, uh, assessments still hold. Well, guys, we do have a link uh, to his website there in the show notes, so you can check that out. But anything else before we go to the end? Anything else? Oh, man, no, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm fired up to uh, get out there on book tour, say hi to everybody. I try to thank as many people as I possibly can on the social channels. That's what I like best about social media is being able to thank that person that reaches out and says that, hey, they like the book, they like the show, or they gifted it to their dad for Father's Day or something like that. And they got to read this book kind of together and discuss it. Uh, so I love just being able to say thank you. That's something that social media allows me to do. Uh, and then on book tour, I get to look people in the eye, shake their hand and, and thank them in person. So I'm uh, excited to see everybody out there on on the road. Very good. Well, guys, uh, you can check out his dates there on his website as well. But Jack, hang tight and we'll get to the spoiler section. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Jack Carr. But before we let you go and before we get to the special spoiler edition questions about Red Sky Morning, I do want to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So here are the links I've got for you today. I've got a links to Jack website, Jack's website, so you can check out all the stuff that he's going to be doing on tour, the blogs he talked about during the interview. Also, I've got a link to where you can pick up your copy of Red Sky Morning, and I've got links to all the other appearances he's had on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. So again, without further ado, very, very last warning, let's get to the spoiler segment about Red Sky Morning. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on face down records the links are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep pushing back darkness keep forging spiritual mental and physical resilience keep seeking the lion of judah All right, Jack, by the magic of modern technology, you are back and we're here after the outro music. Let's dig into some spoilers. And again, guys, you've heard it a hundred times now. There are spoilers ahead. So if you have not read or listened to Red Sky Morning yet, do not pass go. You will not get $200. You certainly will not get a fruit cup. So get out of here. Go move on to the next podcast. So here we go. Three, two, one. All right, Katie. This is James's love interest. This is his fiance. This is his future in a lot of ways. Jack, this is his redemption in a lot of ways. She is shot. And um, it's a very dramatic scene in the book that she shot, her recovery, the way James responds and all that. But after she's shot, James Reese has a vision of his deceased wife and daughter, Lauren and Lucy. And gosh, Jack, I remember it being very emotional because I'm listening to the Ray Porter version. I'm listening to Ray Porter read the book. And I just remember being like overwhelmed with emotion at the scene because I've spent seven thrillers now getting to know James Reese and his psyche and, you know, a few, few, uh, 
a few novels ago, you start really getting into his inner thoughts a little bit more and his inner dialogue. Where did you get the idea for Katie being shot and then immediately Reese gets a vision of Lauren and Lucy? Where, where did that idea come from? Yeah, so I start each novel with a uh, one-page executive summary where I kind of lay out uh, – it's like a letter to myself. Uh, essentially, but also it's similar to what you would read on the back of a paperback or the inside uh, flap jacket of a book and ask myself, Hey, is this, is this worth the next year, year and a half of my life, this idea? And if it's yes, I read it again. And I say, if someone else were to read this as they walked by Hudson news and pulled this off the shelf in an airport, would, uh, would it be en interesting enough for them to devote time to that? They're never going to get back or invest time in. They're never going to get back. Answers. If the answer is yes or probably, then that's the that's my project. Um, so I take that, turn it into an outline. I have a title, so I'm not worried about uh, wasting bandwidth, worried about the title. Um, and then I turn that outline into the narrative. So in the outline, uh, I don't have those visions. I have mm. uh, Katie getting shot. I have the I have the, the sequence of events. But as I'm writing. Then it just naturally happened. It wasn't something that I uh, thought would or wouldn't happen. It just wasn't uh, on my radar. And a lot of that, the lot of what I write isn't in the outline. It's uh, that's a guide. And I know things are going to change in this case or something I thought was going to hundred percent was going to happen. And I got to that stage. Nope. Didn't happen. It didn't, it, it, it didn't, it didn't work. Um, I mean, it would have worked, but it didn't, uh, it wasn't right. I guess is the way to, way to put it. So, so I'm not bound by that outline, but I got to that stage and it just, it just happened. So it was a very natural thing to, to write in as I'm going through that sequence. So, um, that, that just natural. Okay. Interesting. So one thing that I guess I learned about myself, cause again, as I've told you before, I don't really consume fiction. Uh, sometimes it's hard for me to follow the characters. And if it's like a Stephen King novel, it's like, oh my gosh, there's a 74th main character. What is this person's backstory? <laughs> I don't get it. And we all just know the whole world is going to blow up at the end. So it's kind of <laughs> hard to give 600 pages of attention to that. I have no problems with that, with, with your thrillers that you've written in this series so far. But there's there's very few times where there's like a there's a scene or a line even that's sticky. But with this novel, with Red Sky Morning, there is one and it's subtle. And I don't know if, if many people are going to pick up on it. So I'm curious for the guys listening to this right now that have gone through Red Sky Morning, if they picked up on it the way that I did. So this is towards the very end of the book. This is where Alice, you know, the quantum computer, you know, personified as this female character was trying to help Reese escape an island that was about to be destroyed by missiles, you know, short timeline, chaotic. And during this, Reese has another vision and he actually has an interaction with Lauren and Lucy. And in this interaction, they give him permission to live, you know, to live with Katie. Uh, Lauren says that she forgives him and basically demands that, you know, Reese forgive himself for what happened to her and the, and his daughter. And there's a quote, you know, this is his deceased wife talking to him. It's part of God's plan. Forgive yourself. Trust me. Trust us. But then Reese is snapped out of his vision by the voice of Alice. And Reese still thinks Lauren's talking. He still thinks it's Lauren's voice. And there's this one line from the book. It says, the voice was now almost identical to Lauren's. And I remember getting like chills when Ray Porter said that line. And I think I was like mowing the lawn or driving or something. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Rewind, rewind, rewind. And I was like, oh. like, so in a way, Alice, and I'm not trying to, you know, put too much into the story. If it's not there, tell me I'm, you know, being way too poetic and romantic about it. But it's almost like Alice was almost a guiding principle for him, a guiding voice, you know, in, in the Christian world, perhaps it's the Holy Spirit nudging him in a particular way. But to have it be basically the, the, the voice of Lauren, that to me was not insignificant. So tell me if I've got it wrong or tell me if I'm onto something here, Jack. You might be onto something, uh, but it's, uh, it's, I'll let the, the reader, everybody's going to get, that's what's great about a book uh, or a film is that people bring hmm. their own personal experience to it. They bring other books that they've read to it, uh, films, uh, family uh, dynamics, all of that plays into it. So essentially that part that you read might read differently to, to somebody else. And you have essentially uh, two uh, semi-different stories. Uh, so I'll leave that one up to the, up to the reader or listener. Okay. 
Well, very good on that. Now let's go to the very, very end. And so we can talk about the ending as much or as little as you want to. But there have even been though spoilers, been- even though there's spoilers. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see. Well, what do you have? What do you have? So, so all I'm going to say is there have been cliffhangers in this series. There have been significant cliffhangers, so significant that people were mad at you for a calendar year for doing that to them. But on this one, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like there's a cliffhanger. It feels like the loose ends have kind of been tied up. <clears throat> some might even say that they they feel like they, they've gotten some sort of closure with where James Reese is in his life. I'll put it that way. That's about as generically as I can put it. You tell me and let, let's get a little bit. You don't have to get You can get as specific as you want to. Again, guys, you got to go out and buy it and read it or listen to it for yourself. But tell me about the decision to end this thriller in the way that you did. Let's see. Um, it, once again, it was it was natural. I had the ending in mind. All the endings. Uh, I like to know where I'm going. Uh, so I have the endings in mind when I start. It's the endings are part of the outline. Uh, the beginnings are part of the outline. The prologues are part of the outline. Uh, certain significant events that happen in each of the three parts, and in this case, three parts. Other books have had more, um, but uh, significant events in there are, are part of the outline. But the way I end this is. Uh, I knew it at the beginning. I knew it at the start. Mm. So people can go back uh, if they read it twice or listen to it twice, and they might pick up a little more, a few other hints uh, that uh, lead them down this path to uh, to how it couldn't end any other way. So um, yeah, I think we'll leave it at uh, we'll leave it at that. And don't uh, I would say people stay off social media the first uh, the first week this book comes out if you don't want any spoilers. Uh, just stay off until you're done listening or reading the book. Very good. Well, I, I will say several days after I finished um, finished it, I did go back to these last few chapters to be like, did I miss something? Is, is something else here? Like, Because again, I'm like, I know how I am with fiction. Sometimes it's a struggle for me because nonfiction is just basically the world that I'm marinating in all the time. And so I, I'll say for me personally, I picked some different things up on the ending than I did the first time, which is natural. You watch a movie for a second time. You listen to a song for the second time. You're going to pick up different nuances and different things. But um, an absolutely fantastic novel. It shouldn't be a shock to anybody that's that's uh, read or listened to this series for any length of time. But that is officially all for me this time around. Jack, is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, man. No, I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for for listening to the book. And Ray Porter just crushes it every time. He's mm-hmm. such a good guy in real life as well. So he's a dear friend now. So uh, really appreciate the support. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Well, we'll see you again later on this year to talk about your first nonfiction book. So Jack, be well, my friend. You too. Take care.